feed producer, um, you know, what do you need to know, how do, what do you need to measure, and where can you get that sort of information um, from. There are a huge number of acronyms, starting with GFLI, which is a Global Feed LCA Institute. So I will try and talk you through um, all of the acronyms. If I forget, then just please uh, raise your hand or just, just shout or whatever. But I'll, I'll try and explain all of, the, all of the projects that the feed industry has been doing over so many years. And I suppose the first question is, you know, wh wh why? Uh, you know, why did the feed industry choose to be so proactive in this whole area of environmental um, footprinting. And you know, by now, probably, you, you understand exactly why. And I think I'd probably also say, you know, I, on a feed industry basis, I'm so glad we started 10 years ago, because if we hadn't started 10 years ago, we'd have to start now. And we'd be doing a lot of catching up very, uh, very, very quickly. So obviously, we all know the, you know, the net zero and, and the various COPs and all those sorts of things and the challenges, and of course, this is really where it all starts for us as, as feed industry. So, um, yeah, this was, um, well, this was sort of the, the, the next version of Livestock's Long Shadow, which, which interestingly had to be rewritten because it got, it got its numbers wrong on environmental footprinting, but that's another, that's another story. But this is where it all starts. So, obviously, as you know, and if you don't know, then this is a really good starting point. So when you are measuring the environmental footprint or carbon footprint of livestock production, feed represents roughly half of the total emissions. Now, and within that average, it's, it's, it's not a really good average, actually, because those of, you, if you've, those of you who have been involved will know that, as you can see, so if you are, if you are calculating the environmental footprint of broiler production then 80% of the emissions are feed, are from feed. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, that's, that was the catalyst 10 years ago, the imperative 10 years ago, which is, well, if we don't do something, then someone will do something for us. And as a feed industry, you know, we've always pride, I think we should pride ourselves in trying to be proactive on these sorts of things. It's much better that we come up with our own solutions and have, those, uh, have them imposed upon us by those who may not necessarily have our best interests at heart. So this is why we got proactively involved in a number of initiatives which all sort of link together, which I'll, uh, I'll take you through uh, uh, in a moment. So just remember that, because I'll talk about the role that raw materials play in that, but you know, broilers, 80%, pigs, so slightly less, dairy, under half, but um, you, get the, you get the gist. So I suppose what that means is that we, we sort of have both the means to help our farmers and our downstream uh, partners reduce their emissions because to some extent they can't do it without us. Now, what, one of the challenges that we have is quite often our downstream partners think, put together claims and, and strategies and net zero commitments and then ask us afterwards. And so I think one of the things I'll come, come to, come to is, is what we can do as an industry to be more proactive in, to, in trying to make sure that 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 we get there first, have a seat at the table rather than, yeah, rather than have it uh, foist upon us. So, but it also means we have an obligation, by the way. So it's not a free ride. So given that role and responsibility, I mean, I've always seen it. And uh, Alex Doring, the Secretary General from FIFA is here. You know, we've, we've, together with many other colleagues, we've spent a long time on this. You know, th I've always seen this as an opportunity. So, so although it sometimes feels a bit like a threat, you know, if you are responsible for 80% of emissions say, in broiler production, then you know, that provides an opportunity to help in terms of reduce, in to, to reduce the overall environmental impact. So we got involved in a whole load of things, and they all, they're all linked. So just to sort of give you a quick, uh, and I might have to remember the, 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 one of the acronyms here, so I'm going to go to my... So, so the, this started actually um, with, the, with FAO uh, w w way back. I mean, probably more than 10 years, Alex. I mean, certainly... The, the, these publications were, were published in around 2015, but there was a shed load of work that was done before that. I'm referring to the, the, the LEAP, um, and it's the um, Livestock Environmental... Uh, uh, foot, um, no, it's not. It's the environmental li Livestock Environmental Assessment and Performance Partnership. Yeah. Um, so you'll instantly forget that, as, as I have, because it's, it's all known as LEAP. But effectively, what happened was the FAO, on a global basis, started to put together with a whole load of experts, including those from the feed industry, a whole load of, uh, uh, of um, 
publications on how to calculate the environmental footprint of various things, so dairy, sheep, pigs, and also on feed. So that was the first, um, the first, sort of, the first post, as it were, in terms of the, 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 the industry getting together, in this case on a global basis, to put together a standardised methodology. Because clearly, if you are doing environment, and this will come up time and time again, if you're doing environmental footprinting, the first thing you need is a standard methodology, otherwise everybody just calculates it in a completely different way. They pick and choose to get the best result for them, and there's no comparison, and there's no credibility. So the first thing is standard methodology. So where do you start? Where do you finish? What do you include? What don't you include? And I, I, I won't go into that in too much detail because that's going to come on a more technical basis. So that is uh, FAO level. Then around, I think, 2013, the Commission got very, the European Commission got very interested because they had a vision uh, that uh, so the, the consumers in the future would have available to them the environmental impact of everything that they buy, and so that therefore they would make choices based on environmental impact, and that, you know, fairly, that would force producers, innovators, to start looking at the environmental footprint of, of what they produce and start to, to reduce it. So they... Um, set up a series of pilot studies to establish a methodology for, in, for within, within Europe for calculating the environmental footprint of a whole load of things. And because of that obligation that I talked about right at the beginning, we were really keen that we got involved in one of those pilot studies. So we had to sort of pitch for it in a way. But I think, Alex, we were, very, we, were, we were quite convinced that if we didn't do that, then probably somebody else, either the Commission or someone, would do it for us. So, there long runs a long um, project, um, uh, which produced, which published in 2018, um, the PEFCR, which is the Product Environmental Footprint Category Rules. PEFCR. What I, it's the rule book, and you can download it. You can go on the FIFAC website, you can download it, and effectively, that is the rule book for how you calculate the environmental impact of one ton of compound feed delivered to the farm drive, delivered to the farmer. And it, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll explain what it includes in, in a moment or two. So, uh, so now we've got methodology, and we've got, um, and we've got, yeah. So now we've got methodology at a global and a European level. What we realise, and I'll explain why in a moment or two, that all throughout that process. So, so again, going back sort of 10 years and probably coming out of the LEAP project, the FAO project, we also then realised that we would need a, a database of emissions for the raw materials that we use. And I'll explain that in a, more, in a bit more uh, detail because they are so important. And you don't, as a feed producer or anybody actually doing environmental footprinting, you don't necessarily have the data that, or the information that you are required to be able to produce an environmental footprint of animal feed. So at that time then, we started to develop a publicly available uh, LCA life cycle analysis database of, of raw materials. Uh, and that became uh, GFLI, which is a Global Feed LCA Institute. And I'll just say a little bit more about this, and then I'll go into the sort of the, the, the detail to some extent of what that means for us as, as feed producers. So effectively, we have this database. Um, you can all go onto the GFLI uh, website and you can download it. It's, it's free of charge to download. And our objective from GFLI, which is a non-profit organisation, so this is a feed industry uh, non-profit organisation. Our founder members are the large blocks, our European colleagues, uh, uh, our Canadian, American, international colleagues, Norwegian uh, colleagues, all got together uh, 10 years ago and put this um, thing together. And the whole idea of this and other speakers will go into this in a bit more detail, is to provide you, as feed producers or your suppliers or downstream players, to be able to do an, an accurate um, carbon footprint or environmental footprint of the feed um, that you produce. It's because what, we need, what you need to be able to do it at a successful environmental footprint is a combination of methodology, which we have, global and uh, European, which is LEAP and the PEFCR, and also the data which is the database, which is um, GFLI. And they all, both conf they all sort of use the same methodology. They all use the same international standards. And although I tend to, s to talk 
quite a lot about carbon footprinting because as a feed producer, that's what most people ask me about. Actually, environmental footprinting includes a whole load more categories than that. Maybe other speakers can talk about the, input, the relevance of those and, and, and you will know whether you're being asked to do a carbon footprint or you're being asked to do some of these other things as well. But environmental footprints contain 16 or 17 or 18 different um, categories. So we've got methodology and we've got the database. Let me explain why. So the, the, the PEF, the, the Product Environmental Footprint Category Rules, the rule book, one of the, thing, one of the important things it tells you what, you what to do is it tells you what you should know and what we don't expect you to know. So, so I'm now a feed producer, as we are, as many of you are. So as a feed producer, the rule book says we expect you to know a number of things. And this is in this section here. And in the jargon, it's known as pr it's primary data. So in other words, you can't look this up in a book. You, you've got to know your own numbers. And it's not unreasonable, right? So let me explain. So first of all, we expect you to know how much energy you're using to produce your feed. So the kilowatt hours of electricity or the litres of uh, diesel or gas oil or kerosene or, or the cubic metres of gas or whatever it is. So factory energy consumption. Come back to this one in a minute. Um, we also, because it's delivered to the farm, we expect you to know how many litres of diesel you're using per tonne or, or how many kilometres you, you, how many kilometers your average distance to your customer is because that's the way you work out the, the carbon footprint, the environmental footprint of the delivery element of what you're delivering to the farm. It also, and this is where it starts to get, so, so far so good, right? I mean, I think no one's going to argue that they should know the energy consumption. And in terms of the economics of running in a feed business, then who doesn't know what their electricity bill is or their fuel bill is? So that's, that's straightforward. Okay. Um, also relatively straightforward, I would argue, is we expect you to know the formula that you are, the, the raw material composition of the diets that you're putting together, right? So, no, so far, not very controversial. So that it's driven by the raw material um, composition of the diet. So obviously you all have your formulas, you all have your formulation system, so you know what, um, what, what the diet makeup is. <clears throat> um, increasingly, not only do we expect you to know what raw materials you're using, but where they come from. Because when I start going into GFLI and the, and the data, where your raw materials come from becomes pretty, quite important. And obviously that is something that is probably, you know, developing at, I mean, clearly it's very easy in some cases. It's not so easy in other cases. So let me just do this bit, because then what I want to do is focus on this bit. So basically that's what you're meant to know. That's called primary data. And if you like, our role as feed producers is to hand that data over to our farmers, who, are they, who then use that information or whoever's doing their environmental footprint, of course, and often not the farmer, but somebody else. And effectively, that then information all goes, all goes into calculating the emissions from a litre of milk or a kilogram of meat or whatever it is. And that's why you need to provide the nutritional analysis, but that's a sort of the day job as far as we're concerned in terms of, because your, your farmers need to know that. Right. So um, primary data <clears throat> in, in environmental footprinting terms... Scope one and scope two emissions, for those of you who are, you know, who are, into, uh, who are in, into doing that. So that's your scope one and your scope two emissions. OK, so let's turn to this stage. So this is where your raw materials come from. So I haven't mentioned yet the impact that raw materials have on your emissions. So if you calculate, when you calculate, the environmental footprint of one tonne of feed delivered to the farm, you will find that over 90% of those emissions are associated with the raw materials. In fact, actually, it's, no, it's 95%, but I always say over 90% because I don't want to sort of downplay what we do in our factories because clearly, you know, you've got an obligation as a manufacturer to do your own thing as far as reducing your own energy consumption, et cetera, et cetera. So it's scope one, scope two. But really, we're a scope three business, like lots of business. So this is known as scope three. Obviously, it's not directly under your control, but effectively, you're the purchase of the raw materials and they are responsible for 90% of your environmental footprint. So that's why we expect you to know, A, what you're using and increasingly um, where the raw materials <coughs> come from. 
However, what we don't expect you to know as a feed producer is how many kilograms of fertiliser or what the energy used for the storage or harvesting or processing of those raw materials are. What you, there's no way you're going to know that. You're buying a tonne of wheat or a tonne of soya. Um, you don't know how many kilograms uh, of, of fertiliser have been used. That is known as secondary data, so we don't expect you to know that. But it's so important that you need to know it, and that's why GFLI was created, to provide you with that, if you like, that database of what we call secondary data, so that you don't have to work out how many kilograms of fertiliser are used. All of that information is built into this database. So effectively, if you're doing an environmental footprint, you've got all the information that you know yourself, you've got a database available of all information that you don't know, but need to know, and therefore there's no reason why you can't do a carbon footprint or environmental footprint of a tonne of feed that you're manufacturing in your factory. And I'll say it now because I'll, if I don't, I'll forget to say it and then I'll be really crossing myself, which is, I know many of you will be well ahead of this curve, so, you know, good for you. Um, if you haven't started yet, all I would say is start measuring something. So if I, I promise you, that with the tools that we have available we're, and with, you know, with, G, with the GFLI database in particular, it's not that difficult to start taking you know, a dairy diet or a broiler diet, start running the numbers and then start sort of taking things out and putting them back in and again or looking at different raw materials and what happens when you do this, that and that. What you start doing by, by at least starting to measure thing is you start to get an idea of what your numbers look like. So I mean, the only reason I'm confident enough in saying that 95% of your emissions from a tonne of feed will be from raw materials is, because we've, we've, we've all, you know, those of us have done it and know that number, and now within four farmers, and it'll be the same for you, everybody knows that 90% of our emissions come from raw materials because we started calculating our environmental footprint, and that's where, if you like, that's where the, the emphasis now starts to come on, uh, on, on this element. So if you haven't started, make a start. It's not that difficult, and all the tools are available, and increasingly there are more tools becoming available, uh, which will help, as a feed producer now, uh, will help you to, to do that. So effectively, what you have is G the GFLI database, which tells you what the carbon footprint is, and I'm going to use carbon footprint, plus a whole load of other things, for, over, for nearly 1,500 raw materials. So it's not a bad start. So not everything is in there. But those of you who started early on carbon footprints, you will have used tools where there were like four raw materials. You know, or, or actually it just asks you for, are you using a dairy diet? You had no idea how, what the, how they made up the environmental foot. So 1,500 is quite, a, is quite a long list. There are still some gaps, and you know, I'll talk about you know, how, we're, uh, how we're working to fill those gaps. But all I'd say is it won't, it won't stop you doing an environmental footprint. Of a, so um, other speakers are going to talk more about the actual format of the database. All I'll say as a practitioner is, you can download it if you want as an Excel file and start playing with the numbers. So you can go on from there and use sophisticated LCA software. But if you're like me and you quickly want to get hold of the environmental footprint of a wheat from somewhere or other, you just download the database and there's a couple of decisions to be made, but it's fairly straightforward. So obviously what we're trying to encourage everybody to do by making it freely available is we want GFLI to be a reference database because it's so important that if we don't have a reference database, then people start picking and choosing the data which gives them the best result. And then we run in, eventually run into a credibility or a greenwashing problem. So the whole idea of the industry setting up a, and it, and it's, um, it, you know, it conforms to all the standards, the data quality rating, which again, we'll come back to, is, is you know, is, is, uh, is, um, uh, it is at the right level. In other words, it's, it, it has to comply with a, with a large number of the, the, the standards and uh, GHG accounting rules to make sure that, if you like, the data in there is, is robust and accurate. So I've already so so I think, you know, just in terms of using it at the moment, I think, but we're going to come on to this later on. Most people at the moment are using this either because they haven't been asked yet, but they know they're going to, and therefore they want to start running the numbers, or they are being asked, and therefore they're starting to provide that information either proactively or reactively to their farmers or to their milk processor, whoever it is. Um, we will get on to an issue later on this afternoon about claims. So at the moment, if you say to somebody, 
I'm going to, I'm just going to check my lines here. So if you say to somebody, OK, ours is, ours, it, it's, it's a, the, the environmental footprint of our dairy, uh, our 18% dairy compound is, is 100. That's, that's just passing on information from you to the customer. If you say, and it's, but it's 10% lower than it was last year, or it's 10% less than the competitors, or it's 10% less than that, that's a claim. And you cannot make a claim unless it's verified, and it could well be audited or verified by, by an external control authority. So we'll come on later on to talk about where we go coming, coming down the lines in terms of, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, making claims. I've got one, one eye on the, on the clock. And what you see, increasingly now see is, obviously, there's a number of environmental footprinting tools, carbon footprinting tools, both aimed at both the farmer and also the, also the feed industry. And many, if not most of them, not all of them, but many or all of them use GFLI data as their, you know, as their feed, uh, as their feed um, database. So just a last couple of slides on, on, on GFLI, because I'm I've sort of trying to do this from a sort of feed industry point of view, but I've also got my sort of GFLI sort of selling boots on all the time as, as well. So, I mean, what we're trying to ensure is that GFLI has broad support from the industry. So that means you. Um, it means, obviously, from the software developers. It means from the sort of uh, the downstream um, partners. I mean, it's, all, it's always a sort of a slight struggle, but we're trying to make sure that everybody realises that we already have a database. So one of the things that we try to say to policymakers in countries is please don't reinvent the methodology and the data for calculating the emissions from feed because we already have it and we spent 10 years on it. And so obviously that's what we try and make sure that we keep the database. We're trying to keep the database up to date. So there was a big update um, in October um, last year. Obviously now we're at the quite exciting stage where, where if you like what we call branded data owners. So, so for example, um, yeah, the average number for wheat is X, but, you know, I produce wheat from this region or, you know, we don't use as much fertiliser or something, something, something. They're saying, and ours is lower than the average. And we're saying, well, that's really interesting, but two things. First of all, we're not, so I'm talking about four farm. We're not going to use it unless it's in GFLI because we want to have a reference database. And if we pick and choose, we don't have a reference database. Uh, and by the way, uh, you might have data that proves that, but we, we have to check that it, 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 it runs according to the methodology and the data quality that we, you know, that we require. And those, are, those conversations are happening, so we're now starting to get a lot of branded data pe uh, holders coming towards uh, GFLI and saying, look, we realise, because our customers are telling us it needs to be in GFLI, that we, want, that we have to get that data, that data in there. And we're looking to employ more resource in terms of LCA, expertise, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, so just in terms of who we are, so just to stress, GFLI is your, you know, it's a feed industry non-profit organisation and we rely, on, uh, we rely pretty much on membership. So we don't have any massive donations from the European Commission or from anybody. It's being funded by the feed industry, you know, for the feed industry, I, I guess is, is how I'd say it. And we have some, I'll show you the membership, uh, and so we have some great partners from up and down the supply chain, but fundamentally it's a feed industry thing. So we have a board, uh, we have a technical management committee which we rely on heavily. So the board is there to make, you know, to look at how we how we move um, GFLI forward. But fundamentally, the real work is done with the technical management committee. So, so that is where the feed industry LCA experts meet and ensure that the data that we're putting into the system meets the meets the requirement. We also have an external um, oversight board, an independent panel. And effectively, GFLI, although it's incorporated in the US, is run by our colleagues from the Netherlands Agribusiness Service, and they provide uh, the secretariat. So nearly done. Um, so again, this is this is sort of the the sort of the sales pitch to some extent, not necessarily directly, but indirectly, which is um, you can download the data for free, and that's what we want you to do because we want people to use the data. So, that's, so that, that's great from an industry perspective. It's not brilliant from a business model point of view. So we're constantly trying to work out how do we maintain this thing whilst trying to make it free at the point of use, as it were. So we rely quite heavily on, uh, on membership. The other thing that we will do at the moment is, and again, this is getting into the jargon slightly, which at the moment what you can download, download for free is the, what's called the aggregated data. So it will tell you what the carbon footprint is 
in grams per kilogram or kilograms per tonne for wheat from France or UK or Ireland or wherever. That's the aggregated data. What it doesn't tell you, but it's, it's obviously all in there, it, it doesn't tell you how many kilograms of fertiliser were used or you know, what the processing costs were. or the, process, the co That's the disaggregated data. And as people get more and more into this, obviously that's where the value lies. So we, we will eventually make that data available, but that won't be for free. And if you're using GF Lite in a commercial, on a commercial basis, so not you as feed producers, <coughs> but if you're a consultancy company or you're building it into a software tool for which you are charging, then effectively we, then we, 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 we charge for that as well. So um, I won't, you, you all know, I'm not going to go through this, you all know, you can all recognise the, the names and the logos up there. You know, we're very well supported. We thank constantly our members who are standing behind us. Uh, and all I say is, you know, if you are, you, what you can do is, as far as, if you think about what I've said in terms of the imperative here, the dynamic that's going on in the supply chain, you can help us in a number of ways. So first thing is you can start using the database. You know, the more feed industry members start downloading the database, start using it, start referring to it. Yeah, we use GFLI. You can start mentioning it to your, and the several hit, start talking to about GFLI to your suppliers and to your customers and to your downstream, so the milk processors, the meat processors. So that if you like, GFLI as a reference database uh, becomes... Uh, becomes the standard. You can join us if you like to get more involved and sort of help, you know, help sort of contribute to moving this thing um, along. Or, and finally, and or, if you are a data owner and you have, look, I, actually I've got this really low carbon thing that I've invented, then come and talk to us because we'd like to have your, providing it meets the standard, we'd like to have your low carbon thing in our database. So I'm conscious that I've rattled on a bit and tried to explain some of the Acronyms along the so remember methodology, PFCR, database, GFLI, and happy to take any questions if I haven't already confused everybody. So thank you very much.